In this part documentary, we will be examining the book Irish Druids and Old Irish Religion, written by James Ronwick. Now, this was first written in 1894, at the time of the Celtic Revival in, in Ireland, Ireland by W.B. Yeats. Now, bear in mind that this was written when academia in Irish heritage and culture was actually in its infancy. So, hopefully, we'll learn a few things as we explore together. Go, Margaret. Ireland, whether viewed from an antiquarian or an ethnological point of view, is one of the most interesting countries in the world. It is not the less uh, an object of attention from the fact that in its early history there are traces of nearly every kind of pagan belief. It is curious that its literary treasures should have been so long neglected. Of late years, thanks to literary and scientific societies, including the new association fostered by Sir Gavin Duffy, Irish MSS, have engaged much thoughtful investigation. The author of this work, conscious of the importance of inquiry to ancient faiths, has collected such information upon Irish religions as a lengthened course of general reading has thrown in his way, since it may benefit those who have less leisure or opportunity for research. He is content to state various views presented in quotations from writers rather than put forth any special conjectures of his own. Examinations of old myths and folklore will often throw light upon current notions of nationalities. This sketch of the ancient Irish mind might help to confirm the conviction that religion, in the sense of reverence for something beyond the individual, has been ever associated with human nature. Anything, however, apparently absurd to some of us, that tends to restrain vice and exalt virtue, is not to be despised in the development of our race. The heathen Irish had a worshipful spirit. As to their morals, they certainly honoured women more than did the favoured Jews or accomplished Greeks. The Druids, forming one subject of this publication, are still an enigma to us. They were doubtless neither so grandly wise nor so low in reputation as represented by tradition. Their ethical lessons must have assuredly prepared the way for Christian missions. However open to criticism in literary merit, the book claims some kindly consideration as coming from one who, in his 77th year, retains a confiding hope in the march of human intellect and the growth of human brotherhood. Signed, James Bonwick, Norwood, January 1st, 1894. Who were the Druids? This question has agitated the minds of the learned for a long period, and various as well as contradictory have been the replies. Tradition preserves their memory as of a pious and superior race prominently associated with the British Isles and France, and in a lesser degree with Belgium, Holland, Germany, and the lands of Scandinavia. Much romance has been long attached to them. We hear their chants in the stone circles. We listen to the heaven-inspired utterances of the Archdruid as he stands on the capstone of a cold promlick in the eye of the sun, surrounded by the white-robed throng with the bowed worshippers afar. We see the golden sickle reverently cutting off the sacred mistletoe. We follow, in imagination, the solemn procession headed by the cross-bearer. We look under the old oak at the aged druid, instructing disciples in mystic lore and in verses never to be committed to writing. We gaze upon the assembly of kings and chieftains, before whom the wise men debate upon some points of legislation. Then again, we recognise the priests as patriots, resisting the invaders of their homes and loudly chanting the battle hymn. We are at the convocation of Bretons in their deliberations on law and awestruck wait upon the observers of sun and stars or of the signs of the times in the investigation of terrestrial phenomena. We go at them to the judgment upon offenders of an unwritten code and witness the dreaded ordeal or the fiery human sacrifice. But our inquiry is, what is Irish tradition or literature to say about these interesting details concerning Druids? Were the Irish Druids, like those of whom we read, belonged to the other lands? Did they spring up from among the Irish people, or were they strangers from another and distant shore? Could they have formed a distinct community like the tribe of Levi, intermarrying amongst themselves only? Amidst much ignorance and even barbarism, can the Druids have been distinguished by the learning and refinement attributed to them? With our conception of the ancient religions of Ireland, should we credit, credit to Druids with the introduction of sun worship, serpent reverence, and the adoration of idols? 
were they, on contrary, newcomers arriving subsequent to the establishment of the various forms of paganism, and merely uh, known little before the rise of Christianity in Aaron. Druidism has of being of late years so persistently appropriated by the Welsh, that the English, Scotch and Irish have seemed to have no part in the property. Even Stonehenge has been claimed by the Welsh, on the very doubtful story of the Britons Caesar's Teutonic Belgae being driven by Romans to Wales. The true Welsh, the Silures or Iberians, were in the land before the Romans appeared. Gales from Ireland, Kimry from Scotland and England, Belgae from Germany, Bretons, Britons, Saxon, Normans, English, Irish and Flemings go make up the rest. We know nothing of Welsh prehistoric races. Even allowing cromlechs, circles and pillar stones to be called druidical, there are fewer of these stone remains in Wales than in Scotland, Ireland, England or France. As to other antiquitaries, Ireland is richer than Wales in all but Roman ruins. It is hard upon Ireland that her jewels should have been so long neglected and the honours of mystic wisdom have become the sole possession of Wales. It is true, however, that the Irish have been less eager about their ancestral glory in that aspect and have not put forward, as the Welsh have done, a neo druidism to revive the reputation of the ancient order. But Ireland had its jewels, and traditionally lore justifies the country in the acknowledgement of those magi or philosophers. The Welsh have a great advantage over the Irish in the reputed position of a literature termed druidical. They assume to know who the druids were and what they taught by certain writings conveying the secret information. The Irish do not even pretend to, to any such knowledge of their druids. The Welsh therefore look down with pity upon their insular neighbours and plume themselves on being the sole successors of a people who are under true druidical teachings and whose transmitted records reveal these mysteries. The revival of the ancient faith in the organisation called Druids of Prontiprid, having members in other parts of Wales but claiming far larger number of adherents in America, has given more prominence to the druidical lore. The fact of the late simple-minded but learned Archdruid Mayfair Mornwig, a poet and a scholar, after 30 years preaching of Christianity, publicly proclaiming the creed of his heathen forefathers, has naturally startled many thoughtful minds. A writer can affirm from personal knowledge of Mefer that he was no pretender, but an absolute believer in the tenets he taught. It is not therefore surprising that students of anthropology should inquire into this revival. Such teaching is quite different from the Neo-Druidism which arose a few years ago and whose imaginative interpretation of writings in Welsh under the names of Taliesin and Company were endorsed by several distinguished ministries of the Christian religion. Neo-Druidism was brought forward at Eisteddfod's and works were written to show that Welsh Druidism was simply the truth as recorded in the biblical account of the Hebrew patriarchs. Pontypridd Ars Druid held quite another doctrine. He embraced within his fold not only Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, with the promulgators of Hinduism, Buddhism, and the ancient systems of so-called idolatry. He recognised his principles in them all as he simply represented the forces of nature under the guise of personalities. The mantle of the oxygenarian leader has fallen upon Mr. Owen Morgan, better known as Morium, long an able and voluminous writer for the press. His version of Welsh Druidism can be studied in the recently published Light of Britannia. He assumes for his Druids the priority of learning. From the mountains of Britain proceeded the light which produced the wisdom of Egypt, Babylon, Persia, India, Phoenicia, Judea and Greece. They who deem this too large a draft upon fate for acceptance will assuredly discover that this unique work, a mass of curious facts bearing, upon ancient science and be constrained to admit that the light of Britannia is not the product of unreasoning Welsh enthusiasm, but is among the most candidly expressed books ever printed. It was Dr. Lanigan who asserted 
The Christian missionaries early opened schools in opposition to Druids. It was the opinion of Arthur Clyde that much Druidism blended with the Christian learning of the 7th and subsequent centuries. The same might be affirmed of Welsh Druidism. Alluding to astronomical MS of the 14th century, Clive says, I believe that, or rather the knowledge which it contains, it is Druidic survival, a spark transmitted through the Dark Ages. Baum tells us that Druidism continued to exist long after it was officially dead and reproved. Dr. Moran, Bishop of Austria, in his Irish Saints, associates the Welsh Saint David with an Irish Druid. Saint David is the son of a Welsh Christian lady. He came to Minevia on the Welsh promontory, made a fire on the shore, and a smoke filled the land. The bishop then goes on to say, The owner of the district was an Irishman named Bea, a pagan and a druid. He was one of the successful rovers years ago, had carved out territories for themselves on the Welsh coast, and continued to hold them by the sword. He was filled with horror when he saw the smoke that arose from Saint David's fire, and cried out to those who were there with him. The enemy has lit fire shall possess this territory as far as the smoke has spread. They resolved to slay the intruders, but their attempt was frustrated by a miracle. Seeing this, Bea made a grant of the desired site and of the surrounding country to St. David, whose monastery quickly arose. Welsh patriotic zeal would receive a shock from Professor O'Curry's statement. It appears that it was from Aaron that the Isle of Mona, or Anglesey, received its earliest colony, and that that colony was a Druidical people. This viewing has been supported by other testimony. The Welsh Carrick Idris, or Cader Idris, has been identified with the Irish Carrick, Carrick Broda of Dundalk, like Carrick Bryn of Mona, was renowned for astronomical observations. Owen Morgan, in the light of Britannica, has brought forward authorities to support his theory that the Welsh at any rate, could claim for ancestors of the Druids of classical writers. But Lifluck declares the language of so-called Welsh Druids of the early Christian centuries is modern. And even Sharon Turner, for the mythological poems, dare not assign them to the 6th century, nor attribute them to Taliesin. He considers the mystery of the Bards of Britain consists of a number of Christian sentences interpreted according to the arbitrary system of modern mysticism and concludes such are the narrow basis of the fast preconceived system of our days so that the true religion of the Gauls. But Rhys in Celtic Britain asserts the Gaeldelic Celts appear to accept the Druidism but there is no evidence that it was ever the religion of any Britannic people. Again, the northwest of Wales and a great portion of the south of it has always been possession of Gaeldelic people and nearest kinsmen were the Goddells of Ireland. Britannic Celts, who were polytheists of the Aryan type, the non Celtic natives, were under the sway of Druidism, and the Galdic Celts, devotees of a religion which combined polytheism with Druidism. He says the word Khmer merely meant fellow countrymen, though he adds, the Khmer people developed a literature of their own differing from that of other Britannic communities. He makes Carlisle, the centre of their influence before coming down into Wales. The assumption of Welsh advocates may not be very satisfactory to the scholars, and all we know of Druid, Irish Druids furnishes little evidence for romantic conclusions. But why should tradition hold so tenaciously to the theory? Making all allowance for extravagance of views and the variety is not easy to explain these early and particular accounts. Although Welsh Druidism is represented by Welsh writers as being so different from the Gaulish as pictured by French authors or the Irish of Irish scholars, a few words may be allowed from the publication of the enthusiastic Marion of Wales. It is evident, says he, that the Druid believed in the eternity of matter in an atomic condition and also in the eternity of water and that the passive, that is, the feminine principle of divine nature pervaded both from eternity. He imagined a period before creation began, when darkness and silence pervaded illimitable space. The sun is the son of the creator, who is preferred to the Druids as the higher sun of the circle of infinitudes above the zodiacal sun. 
Wherever the solar rites relating to the ancient worship have been performed, those places were still regarded by the masses as sacred. The Anwin of Morian is Hades or Erebus, and that of Northern idea is cold. Of the arch truth, he says, the divine word incarnate, such as our Druidic high priest. Especially when standing on the Logan stone, the Holy Grail was a cauldron of Gurin or Venus. The Druze classical year commenced at midnight, March 20, 21st. God was regarded through the, the symbol of three letters or rods representing the light or the central rays, the true Logos, who, the divine son, was the Menru incarnate. The grave is the matrix of Ked, which bears the same relation to Venus as the creator does to Apollo the sun. The twelve battles of Arthur or the sun relate to the signs of the zodiac. Morian observes two sects in Druidism, the party of the Linga and the party of the Logos. His Druidism is simply solar worship, or in other sense, pure phallicism. According to him, the Christian religion is scientifically arranged on the most ancient framework of British Druidism. A perusal of Morian's Light of Britannia will give the reader an explicit account of the mystery of the Welsh Druidism, but fail to prove its identity with Irish Druidism, although the connection of Ireland with Wales was most intimate before the Danish invaders. Traditional Irish saints having converted to Christianity, their wild neighbours of North and South Wales, as they did those in Cornwall and other places. The Druid, according to Morian, and his distinguished master, the Irish Druid, Mayfair Mormig, was a more picturesque individual than the person figured by Irish writers, and he is strictly associated with so-called Druidic circles, Cromlechs and company, Stonehenge and Avery. Not less than Mona and Printipod are claimed as the scenes of their performances. All the tradition has represented them, or poets have imagined them, the Druids were in the estimation of modern Welsh authorities. Theirs were the hands free from violence, theirs were the mouths free from calumny, theirs the learning without pride, and theirs the love without venery. There were more than what Madame Blatsky said. Only the hairs of the Cyclopean lore left to them by generations of mighty hunters and magicians. They were, as Diodorus declared, philosophers and divines whom they, in Gauls, call Saradine, are held in great veneration. Mayfair left it on record that the Druids of Britain were Brahmins in beyond the least shadow of doubt. Much has, has been written about the Druids' dress their ornaments and the mysteries of their craft. As a glass boat, the cup, and the cross and company, Arch Druid Mayfair at Printpod, not Dr. Price, explains to the present writer, his procession cross with movable arms, his wonderful egg, bequeathed from past ages, his pentanin, writing rods, or staff book, his rosary, used by ancient priests, not less than modern, Mohammedans and Christians, his glass beads, his talk for the neck, his breastplate of judgment, his crescent adornments, his staff of office, etc. The staff, or litus, was a magical import. Wands of tamarisk were in the hands of magician priests. The top of each augur rods were slightly hooked. One found in Etoria had budded on the hand. The barsum, or bundle of twigs, is held by Parse priests. Strabo noted twigs in hand of prayer. The Thesis has several knots. Prometheus hid the fire from heaven in his rod. Glass was known in Egypt some three or four thousand years before Christ. Amber beads, his hid's tears of sisters of Phoebus were in use by Phoenicians, brought probably from the Baltic. Torques have been found in many lands, and as Bacon rem remarked, religion delights in such shadows and disguises. Nash, in his remarks upon the writings of Taliesin, writes, The only place in Britain in which there is any distinct evidence from the Roma authorities of the existence of Druids should be the Isle of Anglesey, the seat of the Irish population before migration from Scotland, of the Cambrian tribes, 
the ancestors of the modern Welsh. He thus fixes the Irish Druids in Wales. When history and philosophy are tracing the great migration of Cambrians into North Wales from Scotland, where their language prevailed before the Gaelic, why is North Britain so little affected by the mysticism associated with Welsh Druidism? A natural reply would be that this particular manifestation came into Wales subsequent to the Cambrian migration from the Western Highlands through Cumberland to the southern side of the Mersey and did not originate within the Cambrian Druids. It must not be forgotten that two distinct races inhabit Wales, the one Celtic of the north and the other Iberian, dark and broad shoulders of the south. Some Iberians, as of Spain and North Africa, retain the most ancient language. Others adopted another tongue. Many of the so-called Arabs in the Sudan are of Iberian parentage. No one can read Morian's most interesting and suggestive Light Britannica without being struck by with the remarkable parallel drawn between the most ancient creeds of Asia and the assumed Druidism of Wales. The supposition of that industrious author is that the British Druids were the originators of the theologies or mythologies of the Old World. Ireland, in its calculations, is quite left out in the cold. Yet it is Ireland, not in Wales, that Oriental religion had their stronger influence. That country, not Wales, would appear to have been visited by Mediterranean traders. True tradition, not well substantiated, makes Cornwall one of their calling places.